In this lesson, we will discuss subgroups generated by a subset and a graph of the subgroups of a group called the subgroup lattice. So we've already discussed subgroups generated by a single element, which we call a cyclic subgroup. So let's recall the definition of a cyclic sub subgroup. If X is an element of a group G, Then the cyclic subgroup generated by X is the set It's a set of all integer powers of the base X. So this is just a special case of the general technique of forming a subgroup that's generated by any subset of the group G. So a cyclic subgroup is, is a subgroup generated by the set containing only one element we can further form subgroups generated by any given subset of G. So this is a cyclic subgroup is just a special case of the following general technique. So given a subset A of G, So A doesn't necessarily have to be a subgroup, just any subset of G. Then the subgroup of G generated by the set A denoted as the cyclic subgroup. It looks like a cyclic subgroup, but the, the set A is the, the generators. And if A is a finite set, you actually just list the elements of A instead of the notation for the set of A. So this subgroup is the smallest subgroup of G that contains A. So it's smallest in the sense that any other subgroup that contains A would also contain this subgroup generated by A. We can be more precise with our definition of the subgroup of G generated by A. So more precisely, Consider all the subgroups that contain the subset A. Let's take the intersection of all of these subgroups. So since the intersection of subgroups of G is a subgroup of G, we define the subgroup generated by A to be equal 
to the intersection of every subgroup of G that contains this subset A. So it's the intersection over all H containing the set A. So A is a subset of H and H has to be a subgroup of G. So this is an intersection of all the subgroups of G that contain A. So it's true that if you take the intersection of any two subgroups, you get a subgroup. So if we do this more times, if you take the intersection of all subgroups of G that contain A, you, you have another subgroup. So now we'll give a couple of notes about this subgroup generated by A. First, the subgroup generated by A is the set of all finite products of elements of A and the inverses of elements of A. If you have a, a set A, you take any elements in A, you take the product of these elements and the products of their inverses, and then any, any element that you can generate in this, in this way will be in the subgroup generated by the set A. So we can kind of write this in set builder notation as the set of all finite products. So I'm going to have up to n factors, n of these factors, a1, a2, a3, and so on. So I have, a, I have a bunch of elements of A, and I can take the finite product of them, but I could also have the inverse. Any, any of these, I could use the inverse of any of these elements. So I'm gonna put a plus or minus one exponent in each base. So this means I could use this, this the element AI or the inverse of AI. So if I take the finite product of all these guys, so each of the AIs are in the set A and N is some non-negative integer. So in other words, I can write any element of the subgroup generated by A as a finite product of elements of A and inverses of elements of A. And note that in, the, in this finite product, we don't know if we're dealing with an abelian group. Some of these elements of A could actually be the same. So these AI are not necessarily distinct. The second note deals with the case when G is actually an abelian group. If G is abelian and you take a finite product of these elements of A, you could actually commute the bases so you can combine all the powers of the set with the same base, with the same generator. So let's look at the subgroup generated by A when G is abelian. So a second note. If G is abelian, then we can commute the AIs
And so we can collect all the powers of the generator's AI. So in particular, if the set A has a finite number of elements, let's say that the set A contains the elements A1, A2, up to AK, then the subgroup generated by A will be the set of all products made up of integer powers of these generators. So then, the, the subgroup generated by A can be written as the set of all elements of the form A1 to some integer N1 times A2 to the integer N2 all the way out to AK to some integer NK. So the exponents are are integers for all i. So if g is a billion, we can commute all the generators, and therefore we can just list every element of the subgroup generated by A as the product of integer powers of the generators. Now let's look at a specific example. Consider the group D8 which consists of symmetries of a square. So there's four rotations, the identity rotation, R, R squared, R cubed. Then there's the reflections, S, S, R, S, R squared, and S, R cubed. So notice that every element of D8 can be written as an integer power of R times an integer power of s. So we can actually write d8 as the group generated by r and s. So again, when you have a finite subset, you can actually just list the generators instead of listing them as a set inside these angle brackets. So D8 is actually generated by the elements R and S since every element of D8 can be written as a finite product of R and S. Now consider a subgroup of D8 Let's look at the subgroup generated by by the elements S and R squared. So this would be the set of all elements that can be written as a finite product of s and r squared. Well, since the order of s is 2, we see that s squared is the identity, but r squared is its own inverse, so r squared squared is the identity. So both generators have order 2. So we see that this subgroup generated by S and R squared, well, if you take any, you take powers of S, you get either S or the identity. So this subgroup will contain the identity, one. It contains S and it contains the generator R squared as well. If I multiply S and R squared, I get the element S R squared. If I keep multiplying factors of s and r squared and simplify, these are the only four elements that we're going to get. 
So this completes the list of the elements of the subgroup. Let's look at one more subgroup. Likewise, we see that the subgroup generated by SR and R squared will contain, this is a subgroup after all, so it will contain the identity because R squared times itself equals the identity. But it will contain the generators SR and R squared. Now if I multiply SR times R squared, I get SR cubed. And then we see that if you keep multiplying any of these elements together, they'll simplify to one of the one of these four elements. So for example, if I took R squared composed with SR cubed, that would give me SR, so on and so forth. So we see that this subgroup generated by SR and R squared contains the four elements, one, SR, R squared, and SR cubed. So in general, if you're going to list out the elements of a subgroup generated by two or more elements, you can just take the product of the generators together and see what other elements you come up with. Next, we're going to look at a graph that helps us visualize the structure of a group by looking at the relationships between the various subgroups. So this graph is called the lattice of subgroups of a group. So this graph, this lattice of subgroups, helps us visualize the relationships among the subgroups. visualize the relationships among the subgroups of a group using a graph called the lattice of subgroups. Of the group. So let's look at an example of a subgroup lattice for the Klein 4 group. Klein 4 group is abbreviated V4 and it has four elements the identity and then elements A, B, and C with the following relation a squared equals B squared equals C squared equals the identity. So th this determines the Cayley table of the Klein 4 group and completely determines all the product relations in this group. So now let's look at the subgroup lattice for V4. So again, I'll give an example of this lattice and then we'll describe how to construct this lattice. So here's the subgroup lattice and we see that there's actually three non-trivial subgroups of V4. The cyclic subgroup generated by A, generated by B, and generated by C. And so this graph shows the relationship between the various subgroups. So the subgroup containing just the identity element is at the bottom. The set itself is at the top of the graph. And then we draw a line between two subgroups if one subgroup is a subgroup of the other. So we see the cyclic subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of V4 and, and so on and so forth. So let's be more specific about how to draw the lattice of subgroups. So to construct a subgroup lattice,
for a finite group G we plot each subgroup of G starting at the bottom with the subgroup containing only the identity element this is a subgroup generated by the identity element which is just the set containing the identity element so we start at the bottom of your graph with um, this trivial subgroup and ending at the top with the group itself. So we try to put subgroups of larger order higher in the graph. We try to put subgroups of larger order higher in the graph. And those of smaller order. And then we saw in the previous example that we put a line segment between two subgroups. We connect subgroup H to a subgroup K at a higher level if H is a subgroup of K and there's no other subgroups in between those two subgroups. So we connect subgroup H to a subgroup K at a higher level with a line segment if H is a subset of K, but there's no other subgroup in between H and K. So, and there are no subgroups properly between H and K. So let's look at another example. Let's give the subgroup lattice of the integers mod 12. The identity element of this group is the element zero. So at the bottom of the subgroup lattice, we'll have the cyclic subgroup generated by zero. And then we see that there are several subgroups of the integers mod 12. And in particular, so for every integer n that divides 12, we know that there is a cyclic subgroup of order n. So the cyclic subgroup of order two would be the subgroup generated by the, the element six. So 
So the cyclic subgroup generated by six is above the trivial subgroup generated by zero. So is the cyclic subgroup generated by four. Now both of these subgroups are actually subgroups of the cyclic subgroup generated by two. Because we know that any multiple of six is also a multiple of two. Also any multiple of four is a multiple of two. But the cyclic subgroup generated by six is also a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by three. Because any multiple of six is also a multiple of three. And then these, the cyclic subgroup generated by three and the cyclic subgroup generated by two are both proper subsets of the whole group and there's no other subgroup above them. So the cyclic subgroup generated by one, which is the same as the set itself, the integers mod 12 are generated by the element one. So this gives the complete subgroup lattice for the integers mod 12. And from this diagram, you can see certain relations. Like for example, we see that the cyclic subgroup generated by six is a subgroup of the subgroup generated by two, and the cyclic subgroup generated by four is a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by two. But then you can see other relations like the fact that the cyclic subgroup generated by six is not a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by four. So this is a nice way to visualize all the subgroups of a given group. Let's look at some more examples. Consider the set of integers mod 30. So there are many subgroups. We know that for any integer n that divides 30, there's a cyclic subgroup of order n. And this lattice, again, we're going to put the subgroup generated by zero at the bottom. And at the first level, we have the cyclic subgroup generated by six, the cyclic subgroup generated by 10, and the cyclic subgroup generated by 15. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 15 has order two, the cyclic subgroup generated by 10 has order three, and the cyclic subgroup generated by six has order five. Now, any multiple of six will be a multiple of two and a multiple of three as well. So the cyclic subgroup generated by six is a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by two, but the subgroup is also a subgroup of the cyclic subgroup generated by three. Now, the cyclic subgroup generated by 15, any multiple of 15 is also a multiple of three. So the subgroup generated by 15 is a subgroup of the subgroup generated by three. And it's a subgroup of the subgroup generated by five. Now multiples of 10 are multiples of two and multiples of five as well. So we have this relationship going on. And then above two, there's only one subgroup of the integers mod 30 that contains two, and that's the, the set itself. So the cyclic subgroup generated by one, which is the same as the set itself, the, the group itself. So this gives the subgroup lattice for the integers mod 30. So again, you can notice several relationships from this from this graph. You can notice things like the subgroup generated by 10 is a subgroup of the subgroup generated by two because there is a line segment connecting these two subgroups. You can always follow a chain going upwards to find other relations like since the cyclic subgroup generated by six is a subgroup of the set generated by two, which is a subgroup of the set generated by one, we see that the cyclic subgroup generated by six is a subgroup of the set generated by one, which is trivial, but I'm just pointing out that you can follow a chain of line segments moving upwards in 
the diagram to establish some relations. Now let's look at a subgroup lattice for a, a non-abelian group. So for example, the subgroup lattice for S3, the set of permutations of the numbers 1, 2, and 3, has subgroup lattice. Again, at the bottom, you have the subgroup generated by the identity permutation. Now, there are three subgroups generated by two cycles. The subgroup generated by the two cycle one, two. The subgroup generated by the permutation one, three. And the subgroup generated by the two cycle two, three. There's also a subgroup generated by the three cycle, one, two, three. And there are no other proper subgroups that contain the subgroups that are already listed. So each of these is a subgroup of S3. So this is the subgroup lattice for S3. Next, we'll give the subgroup lattice for D8. Well, we already established that D8 can be written as the group generated by R and S. And if we list out the elements of D8, again, we have the identity, R, R squared, R cubed, S, SR, SR squared, and SR cubed. Then this subgroup lattice, again, we start at the bottom with the subgroup generated by the identity. Then above this subgroup are the subgroups generated by S, the subgroup generated by SR squared, the subgroup generated by R squared, the subgroup generated by SR and the subgroup generated by SR cubed. Now above R squared, we see that the subgroup generated by R will contain the subgroup generated by R squared. So above R squared, I'll have the subgroup generated by R. And the subgroup generated by S and R squared will contain both the elements in the subgroup of S and the elements in the subgroup generated by S R squared. It will also contain the subgroup generated by R squared. Now on the right side, the subgroup generated by S R and R squared will similarly contain the three subgroups below it. And now there's no other proper subgroups that contain these subgroups on top. So I'm gonna finish this, this subgroup lattice by putting D8 on top. Now we'll look at an example of how you can use the subgroup lattice to identify various structures of a group. So we're going to use the subgroup lattice of D8 to identify a centralizer of an element of D8. So we can use a subgroup lattice to identify centralizers of elements.
So let's compute the centralizer in D8 of the element S using the cell group lattice. Well, we know that S commutes with itself. So since S commutes with itself, and by definition, the centralizer of S would be the set of all elements of D8 that commute with S. So since S commutes with itself, we know that S is an element of its own centralizer. But we also know that the centralizer of any element is actually a subgroup of D8. So the centralizer of S and D8 is actually a subgroup of D8. So if we look at the lattice, we can narrow down the possibilities for the centralizer of S by looking at all the subgroups that contain the element S in the lattice. So let's look back at the lattice. So which subgroups contain the element S? Well, in this lattice, we see that only the subgroup generated by S contains S, the subgroup generated by S and R squared, and then D8. So those are the only subgroups that contain the element S. So these are the only possible candidates for the centralizer of S in D8. So the only subgroups that of D8 that contain S So the only possibilities for the centralizer of S are these three subgroups. The cyclic subgroup generated by S, the subgroup generated by S and R squared, and all of D8. But notice that R squared actually commutes with S. Since R squared S, if we commute R squared and S, then that will equal S R to the minus two, but R to the minus two is the same as R squared in D8. So we see that R squared S is equal to S R squared, so R squared commutes with S. So since R squared commutes with S, we see that R squared is actually an element of the centralizer of S. So we see that eliminates the cyclic subgroup generated by S as the centralizer. But notice that not all of D8 will commute with S. So for example, Rs equals Sr to the minus one, and this does not equal Sr, this equals Sr cubed, which most definitely does not equal Sr. So we see that R does not compute with S. So R is not an element of the centralizer of S. Therefore, the centralizer cannot be all of D8. So therefore, the centralizer of S must be the subgroup generated by S and R squared. 
So this is one application of subgroup lattices. We can help use them to find centralizers of elements. Now let's look back again at the subgroup lattice for D8. And notice that there's a piece of this lattice, a sub lattice, let's call it, right here. If we look at this sub lattice, the structure of the sub lattice looks familiar. It looks it actually looks like the subgroup lattice for the Klein 4 group. So let's look back at that. So consider the subgroup lattice of the Klein 4 group. It has a, the group on top, and then it has three subgroups below it that have order 2, and then below them is the subgroup generated by the identity. So this is the same exact structure as this sub lattice of D8. By comparing lattices of the Klein 4 group and the dihedral group D8, We see that the sub lattice below the subgroup generated by S and R squared is actually identical in structure. to the lattice of V4. And it's actually a fact that this subgroup generated by S and R squared, this is actually isomorphic to the Klein 4 group. And we can, you could probably guess this fact by comparing the subgroup lattices of these groups. So we see that the subgroup lattice of a group can be used to analyze and visualize the structure of the group G.